Good morning. Welcome to Fridays with Mark. As we kind of walk through the Gospel of Mark together, it is uh, Friday, September 11th. And uh, before we kind of dig into the Word this morning, I want to take a moment and just kind of um, first all to pause and and remember and um, remember those that we lost on September 11th, and say a word of thanks to those that are currently serving our nation um, on this day. I remember I was in seminary on September 11th, 2001. Holly and I had been married for about six months. And I remember um, the internet wasn't working weird, and it was working weird at seminary, and uh, we were probably on dial-up at that point at MTS. And um, I just remember th th there were stories on the internet about the, um, some, the plane hitting a tower, and we all, about 100 of us crammed into our student union, which could hold about 50 people, and watched um, watched it all unfold. And I just remember, um, the two things I remember about that day were um, I really wanted to hear Holly's voice. I married about six months, and I just remember I wanted to, I needed to hear her voice that day. And I remember going to our, our uh, Tuesday afternoon class. We didn't cancel it. It was Modern Judaism. And our Rabbi Greenstein from um, one of the synagogues there in Memphis um, shared with us a lot about sorrow and hurt and tragedy, particularly from a Jewish perspective. And that was, um, that was powerful. Um, so today we're thankful for those that serve our nation. Uh, we've got some friends of mine currently deployed on. Friend John Branding, who's a Methodist pastor here in the state, is currently uh, deployed. We're thankful for him. And um, we uh, are thankful for all the men and women that have served our nation. So um, thank you for what you do. And uh, remember those who grieve today and, and each day, because grief is not just one day a year. It's, uh, it, in many ways, grief becomes a lifestyle. It becomes something that hangs on you like a fog. And so uh, we pray for those that are grieving today, and we pray they can find the power of resurrection, even in their pain. Um, but uh, we're looking at Mark chapter 2 today, and um, I, I, want, I want to look primarily at two major things today. First is, is Jesus' call to Mark, or Levi as he's called here. Um, Levi and Mark are the same name. Uh, Levi is the Hebrew form of the name. Um, I'm sorry, Matthew, Hebrew, uh, Levi and Matthew are the same names. Um, Levi is the, is the uh, Hebrew form of Matthew, and Matthew is the Greek form. Um, so it's, I think it's kind of ironic that uh, Mark is a more Gentile-focused gospel, and he calls him Levi, whereas Matthew, a more um, Jewish-focused gospel, uh, he calls himself Matthew. So I just I don't really know what that means. I think it's interesting. Um, anyway, I, I want I want to look at um, verses thirteen through seventeen here, where where Jesus calls him, where it says this. This is verse fourteen, where it says, as he was walking along, he saw saw he being Jesus, saw Levi son of Alphaeus sitting at a text booth and said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. As he sat at dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of, the, of a physician, but those who are sick I have come to call not righteous but sinners. Of course, that's ironic that um, we all need Jesus. I think Jesus there is kind of poking at the self-righteousness of the Pharisees, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that in one second, but uh, about why the Pharisees get their self-righteousness. But um, I want to talk about, a little bit about... Jesus' disciples. We'll see later in Mark about the the names of the disciples, but um, and all that he served. But but tax collectors and I unpacked this one day this week were were literally the the worst of the worst for the Jewish people because they were Jews who were traitors. They had sold out their own people uh, for money. They worked for Rome and they leveraged the power of the Roman government. They, le they leveraged the power of the Roman army to basically extort money from their own people. So they were traitors to their people, and they also used the Gentile armies to basically extort money from their own people. They were literally the worst of the worst to the Jewish people. Um, and yet Jesus sought them out, and they sought Jesus out. And I, and I, I, just, I just think I think it's something interesting. We see in, 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 in this section that Jesus calls Matthew, and, and he doesn't, I heard my my friend Sam Morris tell the story one day about um, why God called Israel, and a rabbi told Sam um, the reason why he called Israel is because he couldn't find a more a, a weaker nation than them. That way, that when good came from Israel, it was clearly because of God. 
I think when God calls completely broken and messed up folk like Matthew, it shows the power of grace and redemption to affect any life. But it also shows that when God transforms a life, he alone should get the credit for that transformation. Matthew was not faithful because Matthew was a good person or a bad person. Matthew is faithful because God is good. Um, so we see him here call this, this tax collector. And we see the Pharisees were uh, upset about it. And, and we, see, we see in the next section uh, questions about fasting and religion. We see on the, uh, the next section after that about the Sabbath. And then uh, I wrote today, we're not going to talk about chapter 3 um, in here, but on my blog that I posted at revandy.org, I talked about the man with a withered hand in chapter 3, and we'll talk about that next week on this video. But um, we talked about the Pharisees and why Jesus and the Pharisees always, always fussed with each other. Well, really, the Pharisees fuss more with Jesus. Although he does kind of, when you read Mark and uh, the seven woes, he really kind of goes off on them. I'm sorry, Matthew and the seven woes. He, he really does kind of go off on them. Um, but I just want to say this. The Pharisees, believe it or not, weren't, weren't evil. They actually had a good intent. The Pharisees arose, uh, and I talk about this today in my, my, my blog. Um, the Pharisees arose um, during the exile period. If you remember your Old Testament history, if you don't, um, in the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham and basically says, I'm paraphrasing here, I'm going to give you a land and I'm going to give you a people. And then with Moses, we see the covenant and God basically says, if you keep the covenant, you'll keep the land. So they didn't keep the covenant and they lost the land. The nation of Israel, which Saul was the first king, then David, then Solomon. After Solomon, the nation divided into two countries. You had Israel, the northern ten tribes. Then you had Judah, the southern two tribes, um, tribes of, of Judah and Benjamin. Um, the southern kingdom, Judah, always had a descendant of David ruling, whereas Israel never did. Um, and those nations were both destroyed. Assyria destroyed Israel, and then Babylon destroyed Judah. And when Babylon destroyed Judah, they took a lot of the leaders back to Babylon with them, with them per the purpose of making them Babylonian, basically. So that's where a lot of things, we, we stories we know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the prophet Daniel, prophet Ezekiel, um, one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 137, um, those were all written during the Babylonian exile. And during this time, uh, a group of teachers and leaders rose up that basically said this, okay, y'all, um, when we were in Israel last time, we didn't keep the law. And look what happened. So if we ever get back home, we're going to keep the law. And so they did. That, that's where the Pharisees came from. They arose from this noble impulse to keep the law and to keep the covenant and to be true to what they said they would do. So their intent started off not wrong. Their intent actually started off to honor God and to keep the covenant. They, now what happened is they, they built in additional laws. Um, so keep the Sabbath, for instance. Okay, well, keeping the Sabbath, what does that mean? How many steps can you take? You know, what can you actually do that, that's considered work? So they built in these additional man-made laws, not out of evil intent, but basically as a buffer, as a way to as a, as a way to safeguard and to make sure the people knew specifically what they should and shouldn't do. So then we see Jesus come along, and Jesus heals on the Sabbath. And instead of saying, wow, uh, someone was healed, they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. You just worked on the Sabbath. And remember what happened last time, we didn't keep the covenant. We lost everything. So they were trying to honor God by keeping the law. But they fell in love with the law and missed the heart of God. I wrote this week that um, religion is not bad. Um, I love the church. I, I love the institution of the church. The church is a broken body. We never need to think that the church is perfect because it's not. It's made up of broken humans like me and you. But but I, I genuinely love the church. I, I really do. And it's very cool in this culture, particularly in the church culture, to, to, to slam the church, uh, to, to slam religion, that it's just me and Jesus. You know, it's just about my individual faith and my individual expression. And I had a professor of mine at seminary who used to always say this. No, this is at, at MC. One of my professors at MC used to always say this. When it's just me and Jesus, 
It's amazing how often Jesus agrees with me. See, I need the church. I need the church to keep me accountable. I need the church to encourage me. I need the church to help me. I need the church to be there for me. It says in the Bible, do not forsake the gathering together in the brethren, as many are prone to do in the last days. Um, it's easy. It's easy. It's so easy in this culture to um, slam religion. I get it. Religion's not bad. Uh, religion's just doing something faithfully. I'm a religious fan of Ole Miss football. I'm a religious fan of the San Francisco Giants baseball team. I'm a religious fan of, of certain TV shows or certain music. That's okay. That's okay. But we never need... That's good. It keeps us faithful. We need to be very careful that we don't place the religion ahead of the object of religion. Religion's good in that it draws me to Jesus. Um, my own personal devotional life is very regimented. Uh, I, I jokingly say, I don't have ADD, I have ADU squirrel. You know, I, I tend to drift. And so I need things to keep me faithful. Um, so I found that to be helpful. Religion's not bad. But religion isn't safe. Jesus saves. The Pharisees focus so much upon the religion that they missed the ultimate point of the religion. The revelation of God completely and totally through Jesus Christ. John 1 says the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ was the complete revelation of who God is. Um, we see in Colossians, He's the visible image of the invisible God. They were so focused on honoring God through the keeping of the law, they missed God's revelation of Himself in Jesus Christ. Um, so just be religious. Um, be faithful. But remember why you're faithful. And remember what it's about. That it's not about keeping of the law for any reason other than to be drawn closer to Jesus Christ. Um, these things are good. Jesus was religious, actually. When you look at his life, he was faithful. He was called rabbi. You didn't just call anyone rabbi. His disciples were faithful. But they were not just focused on keeping the letter of the law. They were about following the purpose of the law. Because that's why Jesus says, the law is summed up in these two things, to love the Lord your God, all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's all you've got to do, guys. Seriously, that's all you've got to do in the world today is love God with every bit of all that you are and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Just do that and you're good, which I, I struggle doing that. And that's why it's about grace. So be faithful. But know this. It's about grace. It's grace that saves us. It's grace that calls us. And it's grace that empowers us to be faithful. So the Pharisees, we're going to see a lot of conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees. And they started off in a very noble place. They really did. But they became guided by fear. And they forgot what they were really about. So don't be afraid. Be faithful. Don't, don't major in the minors. Focus on what matters. And, um, and and let Jesus be the reason why we do these things. Um, so, thanks for um, thanks for visiting with us on uh, on uh, Fridays in Mark. Uh, next week we'll look at Mark chapter three. Uh, and if you wanna if you wanna um, sign up for an email devotional, you can you can go to my blog revandy.org, and uh, there's some great ways to sign up there. We'll be working through Mark um, for until uh, we get done, I reckon. Um, but uh, thanks for watching, and uh, have a great Friday.